So let's start off with the Gen Expert Ultra. And the language also is getting a little bit cooler. We now talk about the NART test. So the nucleic acid amplification test. These are basically all um, DNA or PCR based tests. And these tests have become the gold standard of how we um, think in terms of diagnosis um, of TB. So the fam famous one is the expert MTB. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on that. Um, and I'm sure by now you all are very aware of using line probe assays. Line probe assays might slowly be replaced by these gene expert um, XTR TB experts that we have. And we have a first line line probe assay, which tests for rifampicin and INH. And we have second line line probe assays, which still traditionally test for fluoroquinolones and the injectables from the from the old days. And then we still have our TB culture and, and phenotypic DSTs. So Gene Expert Ultra is basically almost as good as a culture. So there are less and less, um, there's less and less scenarios where you're gonna wait for a culture to actually help give you clarification. The Gene Expert is gonna sort you out most of the time. Cultures become useful if Gene Experts are unsuccessful or if we can't get Gene Experts. And in our people living with HIV, if the gene expert's negative, it's still useful to get a culture off if you're suspecting TB. Um, and of course, any patient where you're concerned about possible drug resistance, so somebody that's been exposed or somebody that's been previously treated, it's also useful to have a TB culture in the background. Smears are still in there, and it'll be interesting if we were to rewrite the guideline, um, because the, the AFB, the smear really only starts becoming useful if you have a lot of bacilli on board. And so in the current era with gene expert, one could wonder, well, what is the point of AFB really? We're using it mostly to try and understand how infective a patient is. So somebody's coughing up AFBs we know is very infective and that might be important, especially when you're talking about drug resistance TB. In the guideline on patients who are gene expert positive, it's still recommended that we do an AFB at baseline at seven weeks and 23 weeks. And I think epidemiologically, it's more helpful because it gives us a bit of an idea of comparing data now with data um, from before. So the Gene Expert Ultra has got a, a, a sensitivity of 87.6% if they're comparing it to culture. So that's very, very good. Um, but of course, it's not as great in HIV positive patients. It's not as great as children. And the biggest issue is, is that about 38 and in some studies, as much as 81% of patients don't produce um, only 38 to 31 percent of patients actually produce sputum. So it's all very well. We can do this lovely gene expert on the sputum, but what if you can't get a sputum? And so there's been a big drive to look at what else can we do gene experts on. Um, and actually, it's been shown that an extra pulmonary TB specimens compared to somebody who's culture positive on that specimen, we have very, very good yield um, in patients on, on the gene expert ultras. And so there's more and more making more and more samples available that we can use the ultra on. One of our high yield samples is on lymph nodes. So when you do an FNA after you've made your slides, rinse your syringe in 1.5 moles of saline, one to 1.5 moles of saline, put it in a normal little sputum bottle, and you can send that for gene expert. Um, and that's much more effective than what you're actually going to get from what they're going to see on the slide. So that's um, an important way to get a sample if you can't get a sputum. Always remember to send your pleural fluids um, for gene expert. The yield with pleural fluid, not as good. So please also send a TB culture. Um, and then also your ascites, your joint fluids, all of those things. The gene expert, not so great on those. So very important to send cultures on those as well. Where expert really comes into its own is on CSF. So the studies have actually shown that it's got a better yield to do a gene expert on your CSF than the TB culture. You're more likely to get a positive result on your expert than you will on your culture. It's also very useful once you've started somebody on treatment. So somebody's already been started on TB treatment, now is developing confusion. You're worried if it's TBM um, and you're worried, well, if I now do, if it was a culture, the culture will be negative because there's already antibiotics on board. But because the gene expert also picks up dead bacilli, that will still be useful. So it's useful to have that um, as a thing. Um, it's unlikely to get a false positive on culture. So your CSF is supposed to be sterile. There's not supposed to be any bacilli floating around in your sterile. So even if you get a trace, trace finding of a gene expert on CSF, that is TB. And you can use that to guide your, guide your treatment. The other thing that's getting very exciting, we're not there yet. Um, although we must find out if our NHLS can do it, because I'm not sure who did this. So Dave Stead and, and, and Co. did a, um, and he's our infectious disease consultant here. They did a study 
where they took patients with TB um, and they did sputums on them, they did urine lambs on them, and they did urine gene experts on them. So you can't just routinely send a urine for a gene expert because it's a particular way in how they, they spin down the urine, they make a little pellet, which they then reconstitute. So there's a little bit of a methodology before they put it in the normal gene expert cartridge. But you can see there, 68% um, in that particular cohort of patients with TB had an expert ultra positive on a urine sample. And compare that to only 45% of those patients had a urine lamb that was positive. And only 34 of those patients actually had a gene expert ultra on sputum that was positive. And that was largely because a lot of them couldn't produce sputum. So of those that could produce sputum, that was the only patients that could actually diagnose. So that looks like an amazing possibility um, and very much also in the diagnosis of children. Sometimes people get a bit confused on what to do with trace results. So remember, this is a PCR test. It's going to be looking at DNA. If it's detected, if it says there's TB there, then there's TB there. That's definitely TB. But sometimes there's not enough DNA so that they can tell whether it's rifampicin resistant or not. Because remember, they're going to read the mutation to see if there's rifampicin resistance. So if somebody is um, MTB complex detected, RIF unsuccessful, you put them on drug-sensitive TB treatment. So sometimes people are being confused and will put them on MDR treatment, but actually most people are going to have drug-sensitive TB Obviously, send another sample, send a culture so we can make sure what kind of resistance patterns there might be. But you start your patient on drug-sensitive TB treatment. Sometimes you'll have an NTB trace detected RIF unsuccessful. And obviously, the RIF will be unsuccessful if you find so little DNA. So there you're going to take your clinical context into consideration. Um, and especially if you've had patients that's had TB in the last two years, there's any dead bacilli lying around. Mm, that might not mean something. So for example, in Gobela, where I used to work, sometimes nurses would trace themselves routinely and they'd be asymptomatic. If they came back with a trace, um, I would certainly not put them on treatment. And you would rather wait for a culture um, or another test to confirm whether there is TB. Except if you're doing it on the LP. If you find it on CSF, a trace is always significant. And then of course, if it says unsuccessful, it just means the test didn't work, please do another one. They also have an algorithm in the new SOP in terms of what to do with your trace result, depending on whether the patient is on TB treatment in the last two years or not. And as I've just mentioned, if they have been on TB treatment in the last two years, then you're going to probably ignore that trace result and do more testing. If they have not had TB treatment in the last two years and you've got a trace, then they recommend do an X-ray to find some other confirmation. Um, and if you've got suggestive, if you've got suggestive TB symptoms, you've got an X-ray that might be suggestive, um, then you will treat in those patients. Patients who are trace and asymptomatic, I would wait before um, putting them on treatment. So the urinary TB lamb has been very exciting. There was a whole new policy that came out in 2021 in terms of covering lamb. Um, and you can see our best sensitivity. So that's been actually being able to pick up TB is in our HIV positive adults with low CD4 counts. Not great in the higher CD4 counts, um, which is partly why we don't bother doing them in those patients. But just notice here, yeah, the debate around children is a little bit different. So you can see in HIV negative children at 32% yield, that's not very high in terms of sensitivity. It's the same for HIV positive children as for HIV positive adults. But remember, it's extremely difficult to get samples on children. So we often don't get sputums on children and we often diagnose children on, on um, clinical grounds. So there's more and more of a look of actually using, easy to get a urine sample on children usually, um, and being able to at least use that. At least if, you if it's negative, it doesn't help you very much, but if it's positive, at least it gives you a clue um, towards TB. So great, hopefully most of you know the indications for urinary lamb, for our inpatients now, therefore any patient who is sick, so if they're admitted to a medical ward, doesn't matter if they've got TB, TB symptoms or not, doesn't matter what their CD4 count is, doesn't matter why they're admitted, if they're sick and they're in your medical ward, you can do a urinary lamb on them. So although the sensitivity is low, it's useful if it's positive, we are gonna pick up some patients. Um, but without patients, we are a little bit of stricter, mainly to help us save on urinary lambs. So then it has to be an HIV positive patient again, who's got signs and symptoms of TB and there the CD4 cutoff is 200, so it's quite high or if somebody's got advanced HIV disease. So if you've got somebody who's quite sick and you don't know the CD4 count and they're HIV positive, by all means, do the lab. Um, it's, 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 and, and again, it's not helpful if it's negative. It's only helpful if it's positive. 
One of the things we obviously often have, and you'll see people walking around the ward trying to look at the land and the light, deciding if it's positive or not. So there's very clear guidelines in terms of what you do with a faint line. So quite often when you do the TB lamb, you might find that you think you're seeing something, but you're not sure. Um, and very important that it is important, they must be at least what they call a one plus intensity of that band. And the biggest thing that will help you is there's a little reference scale card. So in each of the bags with the, with the TB, there is a little reference scale card. If you're looking at the line and you're not sure, go and find the reference scale card. If it's paler than the line on the reference scale card, it's negative. Um, and it's all of the research on TB lamb and all of the stats on TB lamb is done using that one plus intensity positive band. Um, and then just lastly, in terms of diagnostics, uh, of course, what is becoming uh, much more um, uh, used in our clinical practice is what we call FAST. So you're all aware of EFAST, which is what we use, particularly in the trauma setting to look for um, intra, uh, intra bleeds. Um, but FAST is basically similar to the EFAST because you used exactly the same views, but it's actually called a focused ultrasound for HIV and TB. FASH is not going to help you make a definitive diagnosis. It's supportive. So you can see there it's got a sensitivity of about 63%, specificity of 68%. So what you see might not always be TB. But as you guys are getting more and more confident with ultrasound skills, if you start using it as well in your A&Es already for EFAST, you can just start becoming confident on what you're looking for specifically um, for TB. And then in the future, which is going to get more and more interesting, is AI for TB diagnostics. Um, and they've already shown, and there's already in South Africa, it was also in private, that for reading x-rays, AI is much better than clinicians, even very experienced clinicians, in being able to diagnose TB on an x-ray, or at least being more exact about that TB diagnosis. Again, very nonspecific, your x-rays. Um, and it'll be amazing, eventually, ultrasound, that might be, you can put an ultrasound on, and AI can tell you what you're actually seeing. So take a little bit of the cognitive load off doctors and make us feel a little bit irrelevant. Um, but I think in terms of a lot of radiology diagnostics, AI is going to play a big role in the future. So let's just look at some of the highlights out of the national guidelines on the treatment of tuberculosis infection. They came out in February of 